Years in the making, in episode 379 of the Clive Barker podcast, Jose and Ryan have a chat with Phil and Sarah Stokes about their new book, Clive Barker's Dark Worlds. Their work with Clive on other projects such as the Imaginer series and playbooks, memory prophecy and fantasy, upcoming projects, and even a hint of things to come for the archive and Clive Barker himself. Barker fans will not want to miss this one. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and advocate of his art, but Don's unique and inspiring paintings are for sale, and over 50% of the proceeds go to the Arts and Medicine program at the Texas Children's Cancer Center. Click the side banner and follow the link to the Etsy shop to have a look and buy one of his books, and keep an eye out for the return of his original art once it's back from the galleries. All right, well, uh, welcome. This is episode 378 of the Clive Barker Podcast. Good afternoon, Jose. Hi, Ryan. How are we doing today? Good, good. It's uh, 8 o'clock in the morning here. Oh, wow, in Alaska. Yeah. Today, we want to jump right in because we're joined by Phil and Sarah Stokes. Clive Barker fans, of course, will know or should know who Phil and Sarah Stokes are because they they run the the Clive Barker Info Revelation site, the Clive Barker Archive, They've made, this is now, we're, we're going to be talking about the fourth biographical book uh, about Clive written by them. So welcome, Phil and Sarah Stokes. Hey, Ron. Hi there. Hey, hey Jose. We're pleased to be here. Hey, it's so great to talk to you guys. I mean, we've been uh, communicating over the last, I would say, almost 20 years at this point. Oh, yeah. you're, re- you're really going to add it up, are you, Jose? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And somehow this is the first time we're actually talking uh, uh, over the phone with each other, which is uh, uh, great. It's it's really fun to talk to you guys today. And uh, especially after this gorgeous book came out, Clive Barker's Dark Worlds, published by Abram Books and their Cernunos imprint, which is just such a, a beautiful map of Clive Barker's creative endeavors and uh, personal life. It's, can- uh, it's beautiful. I can tell how by how you uh, you went in and your sound went in and out that you reached behind you to grab the book while you were talking. I totally <laughs> did. I totally yeah. did. I can't put this book down, guys. Yeah. It's it's beautiful. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank um, you. Well, thank um, you very much. I mean, I think the Abrams and Sununos have done a super job with the production values. Of it. It's come out beautifully. We think, irrespective of what's actually in it in terms of the words, mm. just as a, a a physical object, it's it's just a glorious glorious thing. Yeah, the team worked really, really hard on it. They got into a lot more detail than we were anticipating, refining it and and making sure that it it covered all the bases. Hats off to them. They made it a better book than we could ever have done on our own. And, and of course, we're talking about the book Clive Barker's Dark Worlds that just recently came out. And you you guys had mentioned, because we were reading the advanced advanced reader copy that that it it really doesn't do justice to it that you really have to feel it and hold it and look at the physical copy and and i was just blown away when i got mine it it is and and it reminds me of the quality of the imaginer series it really feels like sort of a bridge between a a biographical book and 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 one of those art books yeah and and we weren't aiming to do another imaginer but but i know exactly what you mean I, i think the fact that it's got a black and white cover kind of leads you towards that but but the interior i mean it's a totally different experience with the imaginer books the, it's it's all about the art there's almost no text mm-hmm. whereas with this one actually the text balances the images our biggest challenge for this book frankly was how to squeeze 40 or 50 years of creative endeavor into a single book so we started off at a 300 page book and we told Abrams that we couldn't quite squeeze it all in. So they very kindly gave us another 50 pages and I'm really pleased that they did because there are some areas where we've done some deep dives, but there are some areas where there's clearly much more to say. So I think it's, it hopefully serves as a, as a useful overview and reminder and insight into Clive's work, but with luck leaves people in a few areas wanting more. You've been working uh, with uh, Clyde Barker for quite some time now. You had the Revelations website, like Ryan said. You published uh, Volume 1, 2, and 3 of uh, Memory, Prophecy, and Fantasy, which I guess kind of was almost like a precursor in a way to the research that would end up helping you guys make this book, the Dark Worlds book. And uh, you've also made the surface of Clyde Barker's Aberat, 
the nonfiction book, The Painter, the Creature, and the Father of Lies, with, which collected Clive's nonfiction. And you've been making those beautiful little theater playbooks through the Car- Clive Barker archive, which are, are such a delight to be able to read and find out stuff about the production of those plays originally with the Daw Company. And like Ryan said, I also got the impression that this book cover would look almost like a companion to the Imaginer series, because not only are the illustrations inside the book the same quality as you see in Imaginer, but also even the cover has the same kind of black matte Mm -hmm. uh, texture that the Imaginer books have. So this is going right next to those books for me on the shelf. (laughs) Great. And I mean, that's a, it's a lovely overview of the work that we've put out. I guess what, what sits behind all of those is is a desire to share and where possible and where necessary. And it's not always necessary, but where necessary to contextualize the work in a way to make it accessible. So the memory prophecy fantasy books really started from the same source that we started the Revelations website, which was mm-hmm. our own journey of wanting to discover more about what had influenced Clive, uh, the way that he wrote, the themes that were coming through in the work, the the way that themes manifested across different media. And we were discovering that for ourselves as we wrote the books in exactly the same way that we were discovering that as we started to document interviews that Clive had given on the original Revelations website which, as you say, all the way back in 1998, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. And and as far as the plays go, I mean, that really is, thank you for saying you appreciate them. They really are a delight to produce because it truly feels like you're sharing one of Clive's jewels. You're sort of like pulling away the dirt from it and uh, let, letting new eyes see it. And so we've been... Really, really excited to do those and looking forward to do, doing lots more. And with it, them, them being the small sort of paperback, they're more accessible and, and more affordable. I think that every, everybody should buy We've been raving about those, that everyone should buy them. They're a great deal and they're gorgeous. And, and I, I'm hoping that <laughs> there will be a, a complete collection of them at some point when you get, when you get through them. That, that that's definitely the plan as, as, as long as editors from places like abrams <laughs> don't, yeah. don't interrupt us with something else and say mm-hmm. hey how about i've got this really cool idea for a <laughs> book would you do this <laughs> that's a good but problem no, we, to have though it's an excellent problem yeah. to have and obviously the sort of diversity of clive's work and the depth of it means that there's always more to explore whether you're looking backwards or forwards or sideways there's always more to uncover, to help show people, and we just love doing that. And those little playbooks are just perfect size to just throw in a, a book bag and, or have a little pile of them hanging around somewhere on a, on a theater stage. Because one of the things that I think gives this the portability of the books uh, is almost meant to be purchased in larger quantities and produced as a play for like some companies, smaller companies or bigger companies. This is just the perfect book to uh, work on for a production. So hopefully these little books will be able to allow people to produce more plays around the world. Yeah, agreed. And and, and please keep raving about them. That's (laughs) great. I remember... Like you said, back in 98, before that, I used to practically live in the old ClyBarker.com website. And uh, a funny detail is that we recently got in touch with uh, Stephen Dressler and Cheryl Benson. So we might bring them on the show uh, pretty soon. Yeah, next Um, week. So that's going to be interesting. We were very, very happy members of the Lost Souls. And like you, we used to get our information through the Lost Souls website as well. So Cheryl and 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 Stephen did a a super job. And and then later... Craig, who took over some of the running of it. So uh, it'll be fascinating to hear their side, their story next week. So yeah. great. I, I, I wasn't very smart, and I just kept on checking that website every day for months on end. And like, why isn't this? I didn't know about yours for quite a while. <laughs> I didn't realize that that became the new official website. I mean, I, I'm not surprised because it was never the intention for it to become the official website. It was a way for us to document what we were learning. Mm. And it was quite... A surprise to us and, and gratifying that, that people would contact us through the website want, also wanting to find out more so it was as much for ourselves as it was for anyone else 
like you say in the book, at one point you guys ran into the uh, old adage of uh, if you build it, they will come. So the fans started flocking to the website. That's right, because just like you, we were in the Yahoo groups and the sort of Hellraiser web and (laughs) all of these places in sort of the early internet. And this was how our information was shared. And it was a charming time, perhaps, compared to now. Certainly, certainly. I think one of the first revelatory interviews you guys did, you mentioned here in the book that it was, uh, I think it was uh, light motifs and dark beliefs. That was actually the the second interview, right? The first one you guys did was the good, the bad and the light in the dark, correct? (laughs) Yes, which which was a slightly, slightly engineered revelatory interview in that it was um, it was a public event that Clive did in Liverpool at the Everyman Theatre. And right. there, were, there was an extended Q&A with the audience, and that was my question from the audience, was the first time that, that we sat and asked our own questions to Clive. So the first revelatory interview was part of a public event. By the time we got to the second one, we sat with Clive for, I don't know, an hour and a half, hours, a couple think, of hours yeah. in a hotel in London when he was over on one of his book tours. Because by that stage, actually, the website had been running for a little while, and we were in touch with Harper Collins that was doing the publicity for The Essential on that tour. And it was just a delight to sit down. We'd met, we'd met Clive several times at signings up to that point, but we'd never sat down and interviewed him at length. And it was, a, it was such a great experience. We just kept doing it. How wonderful. And what was your first contact with Clive Barker's work? Was it The Books of Blood? Was it Hellraiser? Was it something else? It was a sort of mixture of the Books of Blood and Hellraiser. I think certainly reading the Books of Blood was my first intro into him. Um, We'd also seen a lot of the promotional stuff for Hellraiser. And so there was this, almost everywhere you turned, there were pieces in articles and so on, uh, talking about this amazing new horror guy, Clive Barker, and look at what he's doing in film and in books and so on. So we, like an, an awful lot of other people, were reading the Fangorias and the... All and the Starburst. Starburst, and the, definitely. And the Shock Express. <laughs> so um, so some of the, the horror fanzines in the UK, oh, the mainstream yeah. ones as well. So, uh, yeah, same for me. I'd seen Hellraiser, but I hadn't read the Books of Blood by the time I saw Hellraiser. Um, and I read, But I read them around the same time. And so I'd say sort of late 87 having been teased with the anticipation Mm. of hellraiser for probably the 12 months before that i also started with that uh, hellraiser i believe because we used to have this uh, fantastic film festival in uh, porto portugal which was called fantas porto and uh, so they would always every single edition they would play a hellraiser and usually it would be uh, sometimes the uh, european premiere so i got to meet doug bradley a few times at that small festival in portugal and that was my uh, my first time meeting Doug. And I just got so deep into Clive Barker. We used to have a little bookstore in uh, Oporto called the Britannica Bookstore, which specialized mainly in, in ports from England. That was my go-to store to buy imported books from England. I've always read Clive Barker in English, in the original English. So right. I was very fortunate to be able to do that. And he, he really made me fall in love with the English language. It's great. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's a lovely city uh, to grow up in and with bookstores around you. I mean, it's great fondness for, sure. for Portugal. I guess just jumping back to Hellraiser, I mean, we, we have just had the, the wonderful opportunity to, to see it again on the big screen. Actually, this time last week, we were at the British Film Institute in London and introducing a 35th anniversary screening of Hellraiser with Nick Vince and Simon Bamford. And it's just a joy to see it on the big screen. The sound mix on the 2K print that that Arrow have done is just glorious. It it reveals details that, you know, I've watched Hellraiser many, many times, but but seeing it in a cinema with a full sound system around, it's, it's a wonderful experience. It is gorgeous. When I got the Arrow box, I saw the movie with that restoration that you were talking about. And uh, it was like, in in some ways, it was like watching the movie again for the first time because you just see the textures. And honestly, I started seeing it on the theater, of course. But I think first time I saw Hellraiser was on TV and it wasn't even like in Portuguese TV. It was like some Spanish channel. I flipped the channel and there is 
Frank wearing a, a, a bloody suit telling Kirsty, it's me, it's Uncle Frank. Uh, of course, it was dubbed in Spanish because it was Spanish TV. And I was like, yeah. that was so weird. But that was my first contact. And then, of course, VHS, which is a horrible, horrible uh, quality uh, medium right now. But uh, nowadays with the 4Ks and the 2Ks, it's just it's so beautiful to, to, to go back to that movie and see all the textures and all the wonderful makeup effects that they did for that movie. It's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, totally. If I could go go back and gush a little bit more about Dark Worlds, um, I just wanted to to, to add that um, since we were talking a bit ago about um, about the early days of of Clive Barker fandom, and for me, right after I had seen Nightbreed, and I had to deep dive myself and collect everything there was to collect, and Shadows in Eden came out. And and uh, that was like that's what kind of t- initially taught me about who Clive was and what he did and and I I feel like this book gave me that same feeling again. I'm you know after having done this podcast for ten years and been in the fandom for oh god I don't even want to count how many years but uh, this brought that same feeling back again and it was like suddenly I wanted to go back and read all these books again that are sitting there on the on my shelf it's an incredible book for longtime fans and and f- I think for new fans it'll capture that same feeling that that we all had back in the in the 80s and 90s well thank you first thank you very much that's in- entirely uh, you, you you hit the hit the nail on the head. It's uh, Shadows Needham was a huge inspiration to us, and like you, we found great delight in the amount of material that they managed to get in there in an accessible way that totally inspired us to go looking for the full interviews that were quoted in the in the margins to go looking for more artwork and to seek out all the, all these other things that. Uh, projects that existed before the books of blood that at that time we had very little idea of and if dark worlds can possibly work both for fans who have looked at clive's work for a very long time readers and people looking at the movies and so on and work for people who are new to it one of the nicest responses we've had to it is someone who who said that they were totally inspired by clive's fearlessness the way it shows how a creative life can be so fearless as to work in different media without feeling constrained about what their next step should be and that they were inspired to do that with their own creativity and that's probably the best response we, we've had to dark worlds oh, oh wow what that yeah that's 100 percent what i felt and also i've been telling ryan that i i i, I feel like this book is not only a, a must-have for long-term fans such as we are, but also for people who are starting out with Clive Barker. Mm-hmm. They see the new Hellraiser on Hulu, and they think, oh, that's cool. I'm going to see if I can buy more of Clive Barker's stuff. And they'll see this book, and hopefully, being kind of an accessible book in terms of pricing, they'll be able to get it, and that will put them on a path to, like – Shadows in Eden did for me, which was like, oh, Shadows in Eden had like a bi- bibliography in the at the end, which your book also has a very detailed bibliography. And so this is the the perfect roadmap for someone who knows a little bit of Clive, wants to know more about the artist, wants to know more about what's out there and how it all connects together in the chronology and in the emotional life of, of Clive Barker as an artist. I just think it's beautiful. Thank you. And I think I said at the beginning, it, it, it's a showcase. We, what it is, it's also proving to be is very useful as is, is a calling card. So Clive is already starting to show it to people at studios and at other places who perhaps haven't all, or, or haven't yet appreciated the breadth of his work. So we've been doing that with the Imaginer books for a while. But this one is, uh, is helpful to, to go to people who say, well, I know, I know Clive's a horror writer. Let's let's do a horror project with him but they don't realize he's an artist or they don't realize he's a poet or they haven't appreciated the depth of his theater history and his ability therefore to understand audiences and to construct plots and narratives that that have you know three acts that move seamlessly through so with luck it will also be a wonderful introduction to other aspects of Clive's work for people who are already familiar with one or two but not the breadth I think it's great that you guys open with Hellraiser, even though the book is mostly chronological. 
until the end where you guys talk about more personal stuff. But in the beginning, you open up with Hellraiser, and then you go back in time to go to the Books of Blood. But yeah. just like – That's it, a good way to get, is, the, get the hooks into people. <laughs> oh, you. Um, yeah, very good. That, that's, a great, that's a great opener. It's a great opener for the book. But uh, I've learned so much stuff, and I've, I've been into this stuff for decades, right? And I'm still learning new stuff from your oh, book. Yeah. I'm, I'm still seeing things I've never seen before, stuff that's blowing my mind. Like there's like – Pictures. I'm sure you guys have have had lots of time with the Clyde Barker archive to catalog and uh, go through boxes and boxes of stuff. And this is what it's all about. It's pulling that stuff out and putting it in a book that can make its way to the people who appreciate this work. Like, for example, one of the things that jumps out at me was a detail from the Books of Blood cover where you see a monster with a with a flicking tongue, and then you have the picture of. Nicholas Vince posing anatomically for the monster's position that Clive used to make that particular uh, drawing in the oh my uh, Books of Blood cover. And that's just something I've never seen before. That that's was so cool. Like, oh, well, yeah. That's something we only heard about from talking to him on the podcast. But to be able to see him posing for that, that was like, oh, to be able to put those two things together. That, frankly, is the delight of the archive is finding something which which you can see became something else. No, no, Nick's poses were directly photographed because Clive was about to paint the Books of Blood. So those are directly related. It's a joy to see them. It's just as much a joy to find a scrap of paper that, you know, written in 1976 that suggests uh, the plot for something that you can see became something else in, you know, 1996. So these things just state and come through. I mean, thank you for saying that there are things in there that you don't know, even though you are, you are amongst the hardcore of fans. <laughs> I, I, I guess uh, I know he'll be listening. You know, I, I think our acid test is someone like a Don Bertram. Yes. When Don can tell us that there's artwork he hasn't seen in there, we know we've, we've done something right. Oh, yes. Oh, he's, yes. he's so great. In my physical world here in Fairbanks, Alaska, there's nobody that I can talk to about, <laughs> about about Clive Barker's stuff. And I think that's why I did this podcast. But I think that this book is a current thing that I can point to people and, and say, hey, if you want to understand you know, what I'm doing or if you want to know why I'm obsessed with this person's work, here is the perfect book that will tell you everything that you need to know. And turn to page X where I'm, <laughs> where where my contribution is suitably recorded. <laughs> Thank you. I think yeah. we'd be re remiss not to mention that in Alaska, in the book uh, beneath the surface of Clyde Barker's Aberat, there's a whole section dedicated to that teacher in uh, Kodiak, Pe uh, Peggy O'Leary. Yeah. Yes, which yes. we also Pe had in the uh, podcast. They're out there. It's just sometimes. Yeah. I, I feel like. Clyde well, that's Barker, that's 800 uh, miles away from me, though. Right. <laughs> it's a big area. Yeah. It's, it's like sometimes I feel like people who read Clyde Barker, maybe, I'm, I'm saying this anecdotally, tend to be a little more bookish, maybe a little more introverted. At least I'm speaking personally. And so it, that's why the internet was such a good place for people to start meeting and creating communities. And subsequently, Revelations, the website, the Clyde Barker Archive, have been the lifeblood of the uh, online community in terms of Clyde Barker fandom. I keep praising you guys for all the stuff you did, but it's like, please allow me that because it's been 20 years <laughs> since since I got to talk to you. So uh, this is this is my moment to, to to thank you guys for all this work, which is just tremendous. Well, well thank, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and thank, thank you for you everything you yes, do. So exactly. It's a it's a mutual appreciation society. It's, it's been 10 years doing this podcast and. Uh, Oftentimes you think, is anybody listening to this? But uh, yeah. <laughs> it's so rewarding when you see stuff being quoted. Like you guys mentioned the Occupy Midian stuff. You guys mentioned the podcast and the Nightbreed chapter. By the way, I had a question. You guys mentioned in an email to us in 2014 that you guys were working on a making of Nightbreed book. Is that still a project or did this merge into Dark Worlds? That is still yeah, very much very a project. Much. Oh, oh okay. wow. If only there were more than two of us. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Oh my gosh, you no, guys are going to have more insight on the Nightbreed. Uh, that, that's going to be amazing. Another question yeah. that I had too is that you had mentioned at some point that the archive might become a physical, like a museum. Is that still a thought or something that might happen? Yep, that's uh, still Absolutely. very much an ambition. We would like to, we'd like to physically locate it in London. 
that has its challenges around property prices and availability of suitable locations. Uh, that, that is the plan. Um, we've always wanted to make this stuff available and we're inspired by it and, and we hope that other people will be too. So, so yes, that's absolutely the ambition. And, and we already know that people, sort of academics, all, already reach out to us, uh, studios reach out to us. There are a whole different number of people who have an interest in the archive and so alongside letting people physically access the archive obviously we need to digitize as well to make that access as wide as possible i still don't think there's anything that beats seeing something in real life in front of you turning the pages of a manuscript is unlike clicking a screen and seeing a beautifully photographed manuscript but nevertheless uh, we need to move or it's um, our ambition to move forward on both fronts so that as many people as possible whether they're creatives academics fans readers just people interested in a creative life that all of those people will be able to share in Clive's work and to make it as broad as possible because of course Clive loves to collaborate and so the people he has worked with over long periods we want to make sure that their work is celebrated too Mm, absolutely i know that the first time i visited beverly hills and uh got to see clive's studio and got to see the offices of seraphim i was uh extremely impressed by the sheer amount of stuff that was uh piled up around the amount of canvases that were stacked and uh, organized and the age of some of the things that I saw, whether they were sketches or manuscripts, or they went back to possibly even the early 80s, maybe even before that. And uh, all those things were just in dire need of organization, I would say. <laughs> and so it's, it's great to know that uh, a lot of that stuff is being taken care of. And uh, so when we see pictures of the archive in the website, where is that located? Is that in Los Angeles still, or is it in London? Portions are in Los Angeles, portions that are at top secret location in london oh, okay, okay. <laughs> i'm gonna go search yeah. uh, google maps tonight and see no. if i can find it yeah you, you so, do that um, so when that's a public building a uh, public museum that'll be a pilgrimage definitely for me i, I don't think we'll ever refer to it as a museum because that that sounds static we want this to be a working space for people oh okay a living archive and, and, yeah and, and hopefully what we'd be able to do is uh, rotate the items that were that are available for physical access. So, for example, Nabarat exhibition that wouldn't just be the artwork, but would also be the manuscripts and the sketches and all of the things around that. Or then, you know, flip it around and and have something that talks about, you know, the horror work, the Hellraisers and the Nightbreeds, those sorts of things. And I I think there's there's so much, there's such a richness that we will be able to rotate all of these topics to draw in different types of creatives, different types of people with a huge number of interests. Well, well then we'd have to move to England. <laughs> well, we could give you, I'm game. Give you the, the, the Airbnbs or... <laughs> I'm game. I I, I, I could do it. Uh, if I move back to Portugal, it's just a quick flight to London. So oh I would totally well, I- be on board. <laughs> Knocking on your door, being like, hey, this is Joe, let me in. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the book, we, we've talked about the graphic design of the book, which is beautiful. We got certain pages that, are, for example, the Candyman section, uh, the pages are yellow. Oh, um, yeah. the, Scar- the Scarlet Gospel section has red pages. This is wonderful, but graphic design aside, it's what's inside from cover to cover that's really like the wonderful way that you guys created this text. It takes you by the hand and kind of never lets go. It takes you on a trip, on a journey through Clive Barker's work. This book is uh, something that it, it, it's really hard to put down, and uh, I've really enjoyed the way that you guys created this wonderful construction even though there's synopsis and uh, quotes and stuff like that, it doesn't feel like you guys just put together a bunch of nonfiction and, you know, like, like Shadows in Eden. You guys really created a binding line that goes through the entire thing chronologically and connects us to the artist. 
Again, I think I keep saying the same thing with different words, but it's just, I'm just so impressed by this book, which is just uh, amazing. I guess my question would be, what can we expect in terms of updates to this book when things like Deep Hill come out or the next Aberat? Will that, do do you guys think there might be a um, follow-up to this? Uh, I think that will be, uh, that'll be a question for Abrams as to how well this book does, whether they want a a revision, certainly contractually, there's absolutely the possibility of an of an update and a revised edition when that makes sense. I mean, I think in terms of how we deal with those new projects, I think we'd want enough of them to accumulate to make a revision mm. of Dark Worlds an appropriate project, rather than you know perhaps a spin-off talking about you know where does Deep Hill fit into the chronology of several other works. So I, I can see that we might deal with those as spin-offs. Good, does that good. make sense? Yeah, it made sense. Uh, I once tried to follow the uh, project of the Scarlet Gospels from its inception, and I was looking through all your interviews and looking through all the bits and pieces of Clive's interviews where he was talking that he was working on a new book. And at one point, it looked like this book was going to be a series of vignettes that would be all together with some with different sections. One would be with art and photography and paintings. Then there would be like some short stories collected. And at one point, I think even mentioned that there might be a possibility of the book having uh, visually different styles of pages within the same book. Yeah, like I some, remember that too. Yeah. Yes, that, that original vision, if you like, for, for the Scarlet Gospels was that it would be a beautifully illustrated but heavily erotic book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it would have been lovely to see. I mean, I, I think m- m- the artwork is now available. So in terms of the artwork from around the time, sort of 98, 99, 97, some of those Laluth gallery things, mm. they, they would have formed the bedrock of, of what visually that might have looked like. And the number of the stories did come out in Tonight Again. So if, if you were to put those two things together, you might have a, a pretty good visual picture as to how that might have come out. And I brought this up because you guys have, of course, a chapter about the Scarlet Gospels and and before that a little bit. But uh, I think you guys did a great job of not getting lost in the organic (laughs) tapestry of how a project evolves with Clive. You know, you mentioned Grail in the book as well, which was supposed to be from the point of view of, correct me if I'm wrong, but Joseph of Arimathea's dog would be present yep. at the crucifixion yeah, right. at one point. Yep. And then there would be a scene with like a 13-year-old Harry the Moor. And I remember when Clive was doing the Twitter tree at the time, he was talking about in the Gospels, there was a naked man running through Gethsemane, and he wanted to tell the story that involved all of that crucifixion and be present at the Man of Sorrows crucifixion. And I think at one point he mentioned something about Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ and I remember tweeting at him something like, oh, yeah, that was based on the visions of this nu- French nun. And then he replied back to me and it was like, oh, that's fascinating. Huh? That's cool. I'm looking at finding out more about this. And he was talking about Grail. And so it's crazy how a project starts and then all of a sudden you got these offshoots going off. And then all of a sudden those arms break off and turn into something else. But then they leave behind scars on the project and it just makes it complicated to be able to track what everything – connects to. I guess we'll see if those stories ever come out. So do you guys know anything about the future projects that Clive is working on in terms of gathering a collection of short stories? Yeah, so the short story collection is still very much a priority. He has been writing some new things to go in it. He's been working on, as you know, Deep Hill and on Mercy of the Jackal, which has gone through a couple of different iterations. We've worked quite closely with Clive on sorting through the way that the story might evolve. But now Clive's off doing another pass on Mercy and the Jackal, so we're very excited about that one. We will, I think, see uh, a poetry collection relatively quickly and probably in the short to medium term, one of Clive's Imagining Man photograph books will probably be on the agenda. Oh, wow. That is the event where the character of the the Master of Colors was created, right? Wick? Wick, yeah, Wick. Wick. Yeah, we, we yes. came out of a photography session, yes. But uh, the, the, the idea behind it was that people would be painted in a manner that evoked something that they wanted to transform into. So yes. so something oh. that they could imagine and become through, a, through photography and art. Mm-hmm. Um, Clive will articulate that much, much better. But it's a, it's a project he is absolutely passionate about. 
I remember uh, an early version, which was uh, I think it was called Zoomen, uh, that happened, where he also painted a, a few models. So yep. I remember I remember that happening. That's when I realized body painting was a thing. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> I think Clive has always been extremely visual, even when he had only published written books. When I was reading his books, I always had this very visual movie going in my head because his book his books are so descriptive and so they're so uh, rich in adjectives and descriptions. And then, like Ryan said, I think it was when I started seeing things like the Doodles and Shadows in Eden and uh, Pandemonium Illustrator One and Two that we've recently mm-hmm. discussed. That's when I started realizing that hey, and and Thief of Always was a huge milestone in the the Blakeian tendencies that Clive has in terms of wanting to create a perfect story with not just text, but visuals. So that was when I realized, wow, this is really a very creative artist. And it just happened to start with books, but theater, paintings, photography later in life, or or even earlier. I mean, I I know that he's, he's done photography even before the Books of Blood. This book has it all. Yeah. And, and sort of articulating those connections that you see in Clive's work, trying to articulate the nature of of a man who can create in all these different ways, but still be one singular person, one singular imagination. Mm -hmm. Um, That was the challenge or part of the challenge of Dark Worlds, because people have approached different genres, the different genres that he works in. People have approached him as a horror writer, as an artist, uh, in all these different fields. But what excites us is that I guess the coming together of all of those different things in, in one singular mind and how he chooses to an, express an idea on, on any, any given day. And so you've beautifully articulated that and, and that's hopefully something of what we uh, share in Dark Worlds. Yeah, for example, in, in Chiliad, right? I mean, it was a, a work that came out at a time of deep depression for Clive and that is inextricable from, from the book, right? The whole metaphor that he uses in Chiliad is based on how he was feeling at the time. The beauty of Dark Worlds is the journey that we see how not only Clive's creativity created this work, but also where he was at you know, mentally and emotionally and, and physically uh, at times while he was creating these things. Because definitely you can't separate the physicality of the work uh, and and the emotional uh, turmoil of the artist from the work, it's a great way of contextualizing that while we read this. And I think if we pair Dark Worlds with Dean Winter's The Dark Fantastic and The Creature, The Painter, and The Far- Father of Lies and Imaginer, you have a pretty good solid foundation to understanding not just the art, but also the artist a little bit. With, as we say, still plenty more to explore. So uh, I think we'll be at this for some time between us. Well, and the, the fans thank you for it, definitely. I mean, I know I, I'm i thankful. Uh, and, and I guess, given that we're all here, we should record our thanks to Clive himself. Absolutely. Because he is the inspiration yes. for all of this. And, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and the fact that we're talking about the celebration of a living artist, not doing something retrospectively hundreds of years after somebody it enables us to to enjoy the next phase of creativity as well. So I'm sure Sarah and I will record mm. our thanks to Clive more generally, but I think we should do it through the podcast as yeah. well. Oh, yeah, most definitely. It's all possible because of him. I never thought that I would be dedicating this much of my life to, you know, a writer, filmmaker, painter. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's like I wrote this this interview book is still in process, but we we do have that interview book from our podcast interviews that are coming out. In, in my introduction, I want to take the advantage to just give a sneak preview of of <laughs> I think this is a good thanks to Clive or an explanation of why I've over the years been so keen on trying to push Clive. <laughs> I, I say push in the in the best of. Uh, terms but but tell people around me like hey listen to this watch this movie read this book oftentimes even losing parts of my collection because i'm like here take this you need this in your life read this and then i never see that book again and i have to replace it but i I wrote this and i said in plato's symposium there's a story of those two-faced creatures right birth from the sun the earth and the moon and they had a round body one head with two faces two sets of limbs and walked around like a crab, or they or cart wheeled around their eight limbs around the planets and the stars, and then the gods kind of split them in, in and separated them, right? So I, I 
the part I wrote here, and this is kind of like my explanation and almost like my open letter to Clive is, I said, I believe the gods split us up in more pieces of flesh and light than just two. We love the world. We love people. We love art. We love a million things because they make us feel whole. Inside and outside our minds, we're creating and furnishing the world and the spaces we live in and inhabit it with things that fit our inner selves, that we feel express our hearts in some way. We adorn our souls with art. So it's important to make it as pleasurable, challenging, and interesting as possible. Clive Barker once said that at the LA premiere of the director's cut and of Nightbreed at the Crest in Westwood, that this, this phrase really stuck with me. God gives you the chance to be odd, and the devil gives you normality. <laughs> so the art that we fill our waking lives with is, is very important. They have a formative effect on us, and, and sometimes it just feels like another piece of light that finds its way into a little drawer inside us, you know, that was vacant until that moment. Like Dolly's anthropomorphic cabinet. <laughs> I found a big drawer marked Barker for Hellraiser, Wondrous Art, The Books of Blood, Magica, Cabal, Nightbreed, everything that goes along with it. And I hold this mythology close to my heart, where it makes my world feel a little more comfortable, a little more complete. And thanks, Clive, for doing that. Well, we, we well put. And, it's it's and, incredible. And we can't follow that. No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, this has been really great fun. Thank you for inviting us on. We should do this again sometime soon. Oh, we would love that. Yeah, and and thank you so much for for coming. And uh, we can't wait. Um, we can't wait wait to continue sharing. You know about this book and about the work of the Clive Barker Archive. Brilliant. Well, well, we'll definitely let you know about any anything new that's coming from us and uh, keep you up to date with everything. Oh, that's great. Thank, thank you, you so much, much, Phil and Sarah. Wonderful. Speak soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 So that was uh, Phil and Sarah Stokes with their wonderful book, Clive Barker's Dark Worlds from Abrams, uh, released by, by Abrams Books with their Sir Nuno's imprint. What's coming up next? We're on... Uh, Commentary classics will be Hellraiser Debtor. I know some weeks I put those in on Wednesdays and some weeks I don't because I've got too much stuff going on. We'll be talking to Stephen Dressler and, and Cheryl Benson Green of uh, Lost Souls. You know, Yay! to talk about that fan club slash newsletter slash website. So that'll be great. Jericho Squad will be coming back again. We've already re recorded that. That's already kind of in the can, so to speak. It just needs to be, I need to finish editing it. I want to watch the episode because uh, that day I couldn't I couldn't attend the R, uh, the RPG. So right, uh, right, I'm curious yeah. to know what happens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there were, there were some imitations of your voice. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> or of Chertovir's voice, I should say. And visions of heaven and hell. We'll get to and um, discussing that beautiful book from Rizzoli. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited about all of those. And this podcast having no beginning will have no end.